Oh, please be seated. We are going to start in one, two minutes, please. Bon dia, buenos días, bonjour, good morning. Welcome to the inaugural session of the World Leaders is Alliance Club de Madrid Policy Dialogue on Education for Shared Societies. For me, it's a pleasure to give the floor to uh, Ms. Isabella Mota, president of the Calus Gulbenkian Foundation. Muito bom dia, um, Sr. Ministro dos Negócios Estrangeiros do Governo de Portugal, Sra. Presidente do Clube de Madrid, ilustres chefes de Estado e membros do Clube de Madrid, ilustres convidados, excelências, caros colegas do Conselho de Administração da Fundação Carlos Gubinquian, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. Em nome do Conselho de Administração da Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian e no meu próprio, dou-vos as boas-vindas à Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian. E permito-me uma palavra especial ao Sr. Ministro dos Negócios Estrangeiros, a quem muito agradeço a presença nesta sessão de abertura do encontro promovido pelo Clube de Madrid. Esta instituição, a Fundação nasceu há 62 anos pela mão do nosso fundador, o arménio Carlos de Sarkis Gulbenkian, e nasceu para servir toda a humanidade, promovendo o conhecimento e a qualidade de vida das pessoas através das artes da beneficência da ciência e da educação. Na Fundação, proclamamos o respeito pela diversidade e pela diferença, com especial ênfase e foco na defesa dos mais vulneráveis, a cultura da tolerância e uma discussão livre e esclarecida sobre os principais problemas tão complexos, tão complexos com que nos confrontamos. Carlos Gulbenkian legou-nos os princípios e os valores da perpetuidade, da independência, do rigor e da exigência. Aceitamos este desafio honrando o bem, a beleza e o saber, como quis o fundador, mas também assumido, assumindo um compromisso com o futuro e com as novas gerações, mantendo-nos preparados para inovar e renovar. É assim um motivo de orgulho recebermos os membros do Clube de Madrid, de Madrid e os seus convidados nesta casa. Num tempo em que vão sendo cada vez mais raros os consensos globais, é um privilégio reunir a experiência e a visão esclarecida de tantos e tão distintos líderes democráticos, representantes de diferentes geografias, famílias políticas e percursos profissionais. A relação da Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian com o Clube de Madrid é longa, já desde 2007, que apoiámos uma iniciativa no âmbito do projeto, projeto de Sociedades Partilhadas, desenvolvida nos anos de quintos, em Moçambique. Nessa ocasião, tive a oportunidade de conhecer melhor a natureza da intervenção do Clube, pelo que não posso perder a oportunidade de aqui registar a minha admiração pelo seu trabalho, que ilustra bem a dedicação e o compromisso de cada um dos seus membros 
para com a cidadania e os valores democráticos. Para a agenda da Fundação, o Clube de Madrid é um movimento verdadeiramente inspirador. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, vivemos tempos de inegável complexidade. Os valores, as instituições e os papéis sociais transformam-se a uma enorme velocidade. Na designada Quarta Revolução Industrial, globalizada e hiperconectada, os paradoxos multiplicam-se. De facto, se por um lado as oportunidades de acesso à informação e à participação dos cidadãos nunca foram tão grandes, por outro, o poder de controlar essa mesma informação nunca esteve tão concentrado. Além disso, se é verdade que se esbateram fronteiras e que o diálogo político se faz hoje a uma escala alargada, também é verdade que o multilateralismo é posto em causa e vão sendo cada vez mais frequentes os movimentos que nos dividem. Precisamos de perspectivar uma nova ordem mundial, baseada numa nova forma de cooperação, sob pena de assistirmos a uma fragmentação e a uma progressiva diminuição da nossa capacidade coletiva de responder aos desafios nacionais e globais do futuro. Aliás, como nos avisava ainda a semana passada, o grupo de pessoas eminentes do Global Financial Governance do, G, do, do G20. Por isso, é tão importante para todos nós, Estado e Sociedade Civil, que nos associemos à agenda global da Shared Societies, que são aquelas onde todos os cidadãos participam e se expressam livremente, onde se promove a igualdade de oportunidades e onde se procura o bem comum. Tenho para mim que a exclusão está fortemente associada à violência, embora naturalmente não seja a única causa, à violência, à xenofobia e aos nacionalismos, ao egoísmo que vemos crescer à nossa, ao nosso redor. E a exclusão, seja ela económica, social, cultural ou religiosa, e seja qual for a geografia do planeta, é sempre um obstáculo para uma sociedade partilhada. E a melhor vacina contra a exclusão é a educação. É na escola que se adquirem os conhecimentos fundamentais e indispensáveis para a empregabilidade e para o sucesso profissional. Mas também é na escola, assim como na família e na comunidade, que se devem estimular os valores, atitudes e comportamentos certos para que os jovens naveguem o mar de incertezas e de ambiguidades a que me referia há pouco. A educação, formal, não formal ou informal, a que ocorre na escola ou fora dela, tem finalidade, a finalidade acrescida de dar aos jovens as ferramentas que lhes permitam lidar com problemas complexos, adaptar-se às mudanças, gerir tensões e dilemas. Hoje, as nossas crianças e jovens são inundadas de informação, mas, como referiu o filósofo Bauman, estão famintas de sabedoria. Temos de encontrar formas de ampliar as suas oportunidades de participação e de realização. E falo da resiliência, do pensamento crítico, da criatividade, da capacidade de trabalhar em equipa, de valorizar as diferenças e de comunicar eficazmente e, finalmente, de resolver problemas. E é nestas competências que a Fundação tem investido e continuará a investir nos próximos anos. Para lidar com as tensões atuais e vencer os desafios que se colocam ao desenvolvimento de sociedades partilhadas, na Fundação Carlos Kulbenken acreditamos que a sociedade civil em geral e o movimento filantrópico em particular têm de evoluir, focando-se cada vez mais nas pessoas, produzindo e mobilizando conhecimento novo, 
rigoroso, transferível e transformador, útil para a solução dos problemas complexos. Esta é a nossa agenda para a educação na Fundação Carlos de Gulbenkian, que é uh, um, orientada uh, pelo uh, o professor Guilherme Oliveira Martins. Caro colega, vamos investir naquilo que é, sem dúvida, o mais valioso dos recursos, as pessoas. E a terminar, faço votos para que a Fundação Carlos de Gulbenkian proporciona a todos as melhores condições e um ambiente inspirador para um debate aberto e profícuo que contribua para encontrar as respostas de que o futuro carece. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Now it's a pleasure to give the floor to Madame Baira Vique Freiberga, former president of Latvia, a president of the World Leadership Alliance, CLAD de Madrid. Good morning, Excellencies, friends and collaborators, fellow members of the Club de Madrid, Your Excellency Augusto Santos Silva, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Portuguese Republic, Your Excellency João Costa, Secretary of State for the Republic of Portugal, and dear Mrs. Isabel Motta, uh, President of the Calusta Gulbenkian Foundation, uh, Thank you for your inspiring words, for the inspiring setting here uh, in this place. I'd like to start by thanking all those who have contributed to organizing this very special event. The Club de Madrid World Leadership Alliance has a yearly event, which is called the Policy Dialogue. And this year, uh, the central topic will be on the importance of education. In this, as usual, uh, we have sought uh, to multiply our influence and efforts uh, as former heads of state and government by interacting and partnering with both uh, officials who are hold political office, uh, heads of various uh, international foundations, uh, and in this particular case, people who have experience on the ground about the topic uh, that we're dealing with. So on behalf of the World Leadership Alliance, Club de Madrid, I'd like to start out by thanking the Calbust uh, Gulbenkian Foundation, uh, because these premises, I am sure, uh, will be uh, inspiring uh, because uh, of the many uh, cultural uh, and artistic activities that have been happening here. And uh, uh, we thank you very much for the support in organizing this event and uh, during its uh, happening. Uh, we certainly are most grateful uh, to those who have given their patronage and support, uh, starting out with the presidency of the Portuguese Republic, the government of the Portuguese Republic, and the European Commissioner for Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, Mr. Tibor Navracic. We would particularly like to underscore and thank from the bottom of our hearts the Portuguese members of the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid, uh, President Cavaco Silva, uh, President uh, Sampaio, and President Barroso, uh, who have joined forces in an honorary committee whose commitment and support uh, in the organization of this policy dialogue in Lisbon has been absolutely essential to it happening and I'm sure it will ensure its success. The Club de Madrid has been working on the concept of shared societies uh, for as long as the past 10 years and it seems to us to be one of the absolutely fundamental pillars uh, of the democratic values uh, which the club was founded uh, to defend. Uh, by uh, choosing this term of shared societies, we wish to emphasize 
that apart from the technicalities of democratic governments, uh, which we all know, uh, in the sense of the legal uh, framework, having a constitution, free elections, uh, good governance, and so on, it is a climate in a society, the convictions and the values of its inhabitants that ultimately will shape the quality of life of individuals belonging to various groups and will ensure that there will not be barriers built up a priori uh, between any group and any other. And certainly not uh, barriers of exclusion or of stigmatization uh, uh, or of uh, violence uh, in, in the worst case. Social cohesion then is uh, to us uh, a fundamental tenet of, uh, of democracy. It is very difficult to have uh, democratic governance if within society there are opposing streams of values and deep convictions or identifications uh, that make it extremely hard uh, to engage in dialogue with anybody else and make it extremely hard uh, to uh, work on compromises such as are necessary in, in democratic process because many societies and many groups will consider any concession, uh, any uh, step towards a compromise as being a betrayal of their values. And I think this is the biggest challenge of democracy. Where do we draw the line uh, between our belief in certain principles, our requirement uh, for certain conditions to be met in the life of society and, and its citizens, uh, but how far can we go in engaging others who are not quite ready for the same exact principles, but to try and engage them in a way that hopefully will help to bring us closer together and ultimately avoid violence and conflict. The obstacles to such a global ideal society, as you all know, are many. One of them is the education of young people, uh, and starting with the youngest age, uh, in an acceptance of human diversity uh, and of the complexity uh, of governance. Uh, it is typical for populistic uh, politicians to offer simplistic uh, solutions uh, that they claim uh, to have the universal answer to, to the ills of mankind. Uh, and for disappointed populations, even in a democratic framework, frequently they will choose what sounds to be uh, a simple solution uh, to the ills of their society, rather than opting for something somewhat more complicated, but that is much more likely to produce results in uh, the long run. The question is about access to education, uh, and uh, what, uh, what are the barriers uh, to it being put in place. The uh, previous efforts of uh, the World Leadership Alliance, with, uh, together with its partners, have been to see what are the main challenges, what are the main uh, problems uh, that prevent uh, societies uh, from uh, progressing in terms of becoming ever more inclusive uh, and fair. And uh, the earlier policy dialogues have uh, identified three main ones, and they're the challenges of displacement of populations, which includes migrants, refugees, and displaced persons, uh, violent extremism that starts very early. Uh, we know about children throwing stones and, and, and later using uh, machine guns. Uh, and uh, a, a somewhat uh, leap uh, of, uh, of technology from throwing stones uh, or rockets, uh, the, the digital uh, possibilities, both positive and negative, and the di digital resilience of societies uh, to uh, extremist and uh, negative information, as well as the integrity of the information that in the modern societies we do all receive. Now, uh, the question of migrants and refugees, uh, I can tell you that uh, in my own childhood as a, as a, a child refugee uh, from Latvia, 
uh, with my parents fleeing uh, the Soviet occupation and annexation of my country, uh, and then being, after the end of the war, uh, the Second World War, being declared uh, a DP, a displaced person, uh, uh, for uh, the early part of my childhood, I can tell you that in those days, the, the United Nations organization, which had, was uh, taking some uh, responsibility for the Second World War uh, mass of, of uh, refugees from, from Eastern Europe, uh, had no uh, idea about the needs of children. It is only the refugee uh, population, uh, which luckily was grouped by nationality and language, uh, in the in the DP camps uh, of northern Germany in the British occupation zone, it was the Latvians, in my case, who organized together and improvised uh, in, the, in the barracks uh, and, the, and the former <laughs> prisoner of war barracks uh, that we were housed uh, for quite a time, uh, improvised classes uh, and, and started to teach uh, the children. Uh, later on, we, we became... Uh, 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 migrants and refugees, because the United Nations at that time decided that Europe couldn't handle refugees, if you please, you see. Uh, we were told that Europe was simply unable uh, to absorb uh, these people, and they have to be scattered to the four winds, uh, and they were. Uh, so that uh, I also have a personal experience of uh, this sort of uh, Im the, the problems of, of somebody being an immigrant uh, on two different, con uh, three different continents, uh, five different countries. Uh, uh, it's a very educational experience, but not in a classical sense of the world. And so uh, I, I truly sympathize with all of you who uh, participate in uh, non-governmental bodies uh, that uh, set it as their goal to try and leave no child behind, uh, at least within uh, the purview uh, of your reach. Uh, and we know that today uh, displacement goes on, violence goes on, uh, exclusion goes on, refusal to admit girls to schools in some cases for religious reasons and so on. The, the reasons for excluding children and youngsters from education are too numerous. But we do have to attack them, one by one, and locality by locality. And uh, each country uh, that is represented here by, by the broad membership of the World Leadership Alliance, each country uh, has gone through its own challenges in terms of raising the level of education uh, of its population. Uh, but I think that once you have established a certain level uh, of uh, humane uh, and acceptable uh, access to education, uh, it becomes uh, a duty, I think, to reach out to those parts of the world where this is not yet the case. And so that even as we think about what would be the best forms of education that would prevent the kinds of problems that we face in countries which in some cases are in a state of failed states, where the internal governance uh, is really has collapsed uh, in the face of either militant, well-equipped, armed uh, groupings, uh, drug lords, and international crime, and so on and so forth. We do have to keep trying, uh, and we do have to keep thinking that every day that goes by, and every month that goes by, is a month lost in the life of some child, of some youngster, uh, or indeed a person of any age, uh, for whom this might have been the step and the opportunity to allow them to move forward. So in that sense, I uh, am very grateful in the name of all my colleagues in the World Leadership Club de Madrid for the collaboration of the organizations we've been working with. and. Uh, uh, in preparation for this global ag agenda, uh, I'd like to thank our knowledge partners, who include the Mercy Corps, Hadaya, uh, the Aga Khan Development Network, and numerous other organizations who have been uh, taking uh, an active role in the working groups that they have led so far. 
Uh, and I certainly look forward to the outcome of the working groups that will be taking place here. Um, certainly, we are thankful for the support of the city of Lisbon. And uh, we, uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of expressing our gratitude already to the mayor who received us in a splendid um, municipal um, uh, center. Uh, we uh, thank the Santa Casa de Misericordia, the Ibero American Secretary General and the Varki Foundation, all of them for their institutional support, and uh, to our official media partner. O Journal Economico. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a few very exciting days ahead of us. And just think of it, some brilliant insights that you may gain uh, during this policy dialogue might make a difference in some child's life uh, that will change him forever. Just that alone would be worth the effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's an honor to give the floor to His Excellency Augusto Santos Silva, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Portuguese Republic. Muito bom dia. Falarei em português, naturalmente. Senhora Presidente do Clube de Madrid. Senhoras ex-presidentes Jorge Sampaio e uh, Aníbal Cavaco Silva, Senhora Presidente da Fundação Gulbenkian, caro colega de Governo, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, uh, bom dia a todos. Em nome do Governo Português, queria felicitar uh, o Clube de Madrid por uh, esta realização e pela escolha do tema da educação. É muito importante que uh, aqueles que provaram bem, servindo os respectivos países, nos mais altos cargos, tenham este interesse e esta disponibilidade a ensinar-nos a nós como uh, os resultados da sua experiência, as lições da sua vida e também uh, as perspectivas de políticas públicas que uh, conseguiram abrir e sobre as quais refletem. E é muito importante também que o tema deste Policy Dialogue seja a educação. Sempre que penso na maneira como o Portugal participa e se afirma na comunidade internacional, penso imediatamente que a educação é para nós uma excelente perspectiva para essa afirmação. Em primeiro lugar no quadro da Agenda 2030, da Agenda do Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Essa agenda define os objetivos que nós todos queremos alcançar no horizonte de 2003 e em termos do nosso desenvolvimento. Parte de um princípio absolutamente fundamental e esse princípio é o de que não há nenhum país que possa hoje considerar-se suficientemente desenvolvido. A antiga distinção entre países em desenvolvimento e países desenvolvidos carece hoje totalmente de sentido. Todos nós temos recursos e todos nós temos problemas. E a educação de qualidade para todos, o objetivo 4, é um objetivo que nos mobiliza a todos, porque todos nós temos de continuar a fazer muito para assegurar a educação de qualidade para todos. E, portanto, no quadro da Agenda 2030, dessa nossa gramática para o desenvolvimento, a educação constitui um objetivo essencial e quando nós tivemos em Portugal de escolher entre os 17 objetivos aqueles quatro que considerávamos prioritários, não hesitamos em escolher esse objetivo da educação de qualidade para todos. Mas há um segundo plano em que a educação nos ajuda muito a definir a nossa participação na comunidade internacional. E é o plano da cooperação. A cooperação em educação 
é uma das linhas mestras da cooperação para o desenvolvimento que praticamos. praticámos la naturalmente no contexto da comunidade dos países de língua portuguesa. A educação é um tema essencial dos projetos de cooperação multilateral que animam a Cplp e também dos projetos bilaterais entre Portugal e todos os restantes países africanos de língua portuguesa e Timor-Leste. praticámos la no âmbito da Conferência Ibero-Americana e do Espaço Ibero-Americano, onde o tema da educação e, em particular, da educação superior é decisivo. Basta pensar que, de acordo com as estimativas, se calcula que no espaço ibero-americano um quarto a um terço dos atuais estudantes do ensino superior sejam nas respectivas famílias os primeiros que atingem o ensino superior. Basta pensar neste facto para ver o enorme recurso que está neste processo e como nós não podemos desperdiçar esse recurso. Mas também esta importância da educação na cooperação entre todos faz-se sentir noutro espaço de cooperação a que Portugal também pertence com muito orgulho, que é o espaço do Mediterrâneo e da União para o Mediterrâneo. A única organização internacional que agrupa todos, digo todos, os 43 países que rodeiam o mar Mediterrâneo. E aí a experiência da Universidade de Fez, como uma instituição que promove os valores da cooperação, da tolerância, do interculturalismo, do respeito recíproco em todo o espaço mediterrâneo, esse exemplo basta para pensar quão importante é a educação para favorecer a cooperação entre nós todos. Mas também há outro plano, que é o plano da construção europeia. E já não se trata apenas de cooperação entre os 28 Estados-membros, trata-se mesmo da construção de uma entidade política, a União Europeia, e do projeto de integração de todos esses Estados nos mais variados domínios. Todos nós, ou melhor, nenhum de nós, hesita em mencionar o programa Erasmus sempre que alguém pergunta um exemplo de um programa europeu que tenha provado especialmente bem na vida concreta das pessoas. Até a Comissão Europeia costuma dizer com graça, mas propriedade, que até temos a favor do programa Erasmus um milhão de bebés já nascidos de casais Erasmus. Mas este é apenas um exemplo, porque o projeto do espaço eh, europeu do ensino superior é outro dos é outros pilares de fundação da nossa integração europeia. E toda a colaboração hoje cotidiana das nossas autoridades educativas, dos nossos professores, dos pais, das organizações não governamentais, dos estudantes, em torno da educação básica, secundária e superior, toda essa colaboração é também a Europa a fazer-se no dia a dia e a fazer-se nos seus próprios fundamentos. E a, a educação é também uma das formas que nós temos mais eficazes e também mais urgentes para acudir àqueles de entre nós que vivem situações de emergência. Em Portugal nós temos muito orgulho da iniciativa, a que gostamos de chamar Iniciativa Jorge Sampaio, porque foi o presidente Jorge Sampaio que a lançou, a iniciativa de apoio aos estudantes sírios, que procurou garantir a um conjunto crescente de estudantes cujos estudos superiores tinham sido interrompidos por causa da crise na Síria, a possibilidade de retomar, continuar e concluir esses estudos superiores. E hoje trabalhamos no conjunto das Nações Unidas com a Comissão Europeia e com muitos outros atores internacionais 
na montagem de um verdadeiro mecanismo de reação rápida da comunidade internacional a situações de emergência no ensino superior. Porque não é só na Síria que se coloca a impossibilidade ou enorme dificuldade de continuação dos estudos. Coloca-se no Iêmen, coloca-se na Líbia, coloca-se na Venezuela e em tantos outros países, infelizmente, do mundo. Ora, este mecanismo de resposta rápida não é apenas um mecanismo de emergência, é um instrumento que nós temos para assegurar a reconstrução das sociedades e para assegurar que sociedades que hoje passam por um enorme sofrimento não desperdicem aquilo que é tão essencial que é o capital humano, os recursos humanos, a qualificação das pessoas. E, finalmente, o plano mais global, o plano das Nações Unidas e, em particular, da sua Agência para a Educação, a Ciência, a Cultura e a Comunicação, a Unesco. Eu recordo sempre as palavras luminosas do preâmbulo da Unesco, quando foi constituída logo a seguir ao fim da Segunda Guerra Mundial. E essas palavras dizem-se mais ou menos isto, se foi no espírito dos homens que, nos anos 30, nasceram as sementes da guerra, é no espírito dos homens que nós temos que construir os baluartes da paz. E isso hoje é tão pertinente quanto era há 70 anos atrás. Porque também hoje nós vemos todos os dias, no espírito dos homens, no espírito das pessoas, nascerem novos germes de intolerância, de conflitualidade, de desrespeito e até de guerra. E, mais uma vez, é necessário, no espírito das pessoas, reconstruir os baluartes da paz. Comecei, portanto, pelo desenvolvimento e acabo na paz. E como muito bem diz o secretário-geral das Nações Unidas, aquilo que une o desenvolvimento e a paz são os direitos humanos e trabalhar em prol da educação é trabalhar em prol de um dos mais básicos e fundamentais dos nossos direitos. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much to all the speakers in the inaugural session. We will continue dearly with the first plenary, the transformative power of education, building shared societies. And I have the pleasure to give the floor to the facilitator, Mr. Dov Lynch. He is the Chief of Section, Global Citizenship and Peace Education in UNESCO. Please, Mr. Lynch. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, very much for this invitation. I'm deeply honored to be here as a representative of UNESCO to this policy dialogue on uh, education for shared societies. And we just heard a very good introduction uh, from the Foreign Minister on the constitution of UNESCO and the importance of building peace in the minds of men and women. And of course, this starts as early as possible. This starts on the benches of schools, if possible. Um, my name is Dov Lynch. I'm the chief of section for Global Citizenship and Peace Education at UNESCO. On behalf of the UNESCO Director General, I'm also the uh, P, uh, Preventing Violent Extremism Focal Point with the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism in New York. And we see strong echoes between the concept of shared societies developed by the Club de Madrid and the work that UNESCO is leading. And we heard a very good reminder of the definition today from President Vike Freiberger. Thank you very much. To build shared societies, of course, education is absolutely vital. Our starting point is clear, I believe. Education is a basic human right. It's a public good that is transformative for individuals, for societies, for economies, but not just any education. We need quality education that is inclusive, that leaves no one behind. We need education that is relevant to challenges. We need education that provides skills for markets today and tomorrow, but not only. We need education that provides values, attitudes, for learning to live together peacefully in a world of change, in societies that are transforming more quickly every day, that are more diverse, and on a planet which is under rising pressure. This is the importance of UNESCO's holistic vision of education, I think one which is shared by the Club de Madrid, to empower every learner with skills, values, attitudes, and behaviors to live together, 
to engage as global citizens, to build more peaceful, sustainable societies, indeed shared societies. And this vision is enshrined at the global level with the Sustainable uh, Development Goal 4, uh, which UNESCO is entrusted to lead forward with member states to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That's the goal. There's been progress across the world, but we are far from the goals. The Secretary General's recent Sustainable Development Goals report is very clear. Far too many children and adolescents worldwide are out of school. Far too many do not meet minimum proficiency in basic skills. Disparities in education still run far too deep along the lines of gender, the rural, uh, urban divide. Far more investments in education, infrastructure, and teachers are required, especially in these developing countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, more action is required, more support is required. And here, perhaps, is the importance of the, the World Leadership Alliance of Club de Madrid as a soft power platform to raise the right questions to help shape the agenda. And this uh, soft power is embodied by the uh, distinguished panelists we will have today. And we will start with the words in a video message from His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, of course, Prime Minister of the Portuguese Republic, 1995-2002. Uh, uh, if you could have the video, please. It is my pleasure to greet old friends and new as you gather for this policy dialogue of the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid. I have fond memories of participating in your rich and illuminated gatherings. This year, I very much welcome your focus on education. In our world today, there is no better investment. That is why Sustainable Development Goal 4 calls for equitable, quality education for all. Unfortunately, many people are still being left behind. Millions of children and adolescents are out of school. Many are migrants and refugees. And millions are also not getting the skills they need to compete in today's digital economy. Education and the pathways it opens up are also a powerful tool for countering and preventing violent extremism. The United Nations is grateful for your efforts to mobilize political will behind this crucial force for principle and peace. I wish you fruitful discussions. Obrigado. Bravo. In this spirit, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, uh, invite onto the stage our distinguished panelists. We have, uh, they need no introduction, especially in Lisbon, I think, the, the great city of Lisbon. We're honored to welcome today His Excellency Jorge Branco de Sapao, President of the Republic of Portugal and Club de Madrid member, please. Uh, His Excellency Anibal Carvaco Silva, President of the Republic of Portugal, Prime Minister of the Republic of Portugal and Club de Madrid member, please. His Excellency Jose Manuel Durao Barroso, Prime Minister of Portugal, and also Her Excellency Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of the Ibero-American Conference. Thank you very much. His Excellency Jorge Branco de Sapao, I'd like to start with you, if I may. We know that education plays such a crucial role in emergency situations, uh, conflicts, natural disasters, and building reliance and building resilience among students, learners, and catalyzing them on the path to recovery. Now, can you, beyond helping individual students, um, beyond specific crises, His Excellency de saint -Pierre, what would be, in your view, a more systemic uh, solution to the systemic challenge of providing higher education opportunities in, emer in emergencies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much. Your Excellency is uh, President of the Club of Madrid, dear colleagues, members of the Club of Madrid, distinguished speakers and guests, caros colegas, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, my best greetings in Portuguese, para começar, e agora, como a maioria, obviamente, se não a totalidade, falam perfeito inglês, eu direi o resto que quero dizer em inglês. I am really thrilled to participate in this policy dialogue session, and let me give you some 
uh, context before answering your uh, very decisive question. Uh, as some of you may know, in uh, 2013, uh, after I stepped down as a United Nations High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, I decided to launch an emergency scholarship program for Syrian students. At that time, I didn't really know that the road would be so long and so hard, but I was fortunate that I did not walk alone. Since day one, I was backed by a group of partners who believed in our project and gave us generous and continuous support. Thanks to our joint action, we have made possible that a number of young men and women from Syria resumed their studies and built hope for the future in spite of the devastating war that was been raging uh, for almost eight years. Our journey was very difficult, yes, but also exceedingly gratifying for it has opened avenues of opportunity and lasting transformation for people who have been running short on prospects and positive expectations. We are proud of our students and of their families who trusted us. Mothers and fathers who knew nothing about us but trusted us to take care of the education of their daughters and sons. Today they are proud of them for these young men and women are leading by example, showing their communities that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Since 2013, almost 400 annual scholarships were awarded and it is extremely significant that 55 of our students have already graduated with master's degrees. This would, of course, have been impossible without Portuguese commitment and of the universities and polytechnics of this country. Most, and in other countries too, most of these graduated students are already working in their fields of expertise. They are gaining experience and they are gaining know-how. Almost all share the same dream to be part of the next generation who will rebuild war torn Syria. Your Excellencies, building upon best practices, and I chose this path for my introductory responses, building upon the best practices and lessons learned with the Syrian program, we have quickly realized that if with 35 conflicts going on and, and millions of students affected by crisis, there are and there is an urgent need for a systemic solution to what it is a true systemic problem. Against this backdrop, we have developed a bigger, more ambitious project, one that will set up a rapid response mechanism for higher education in emergencies with, of course, the support of my country in general. This means that when a crisis is declared, students will not wait for years until finding an opportunity to resume their studies, but they will be able to go through a higher education fast track that will be part of the humanitarian responses to crisis. This mechanism will allow to prevent, and this I think is essential, to prevent lost generations of university graduates. On top of that, the Rapid Response Mechanism, or RRM, will provide an open forum for the academic community, policy makers, officials, foundations, NGOs, and the private sector to discuss any issues of common interest in the framework of advancing higher education in emergencies and in conflict-affecting societies, complementing the work already being carried out in bilateral and multilateral fora. I hope that during these two days, participants will have the opportunity to discuss avenues for long-lasting collaboration in order to deliver us more, better, and faster higher education opportunities in crisis situation, and therefore achieve transformative change. Before drawing to a close, I would like you to watch a short, very short animation film that we have produced. Some of us, of course, have seen it already, but we can never lose an opportunity. We have produced in order to provide you a clear overview of the RRM project. I invite all of you to join up this project and our collaboration to this great project of the Club of Madrid. Many thanks and wish you a good work. And so if you give us just one more minute.
my fellow panelists. And can we have the video, please? In 2016, 65.6 million people, or one person in 113, were displaced from their homes due to conflict, persecution, violence, human rights violations, or because of natural disasters. Regretfully, war, not peace, has momentum. Since 2010, each year has seen more conflict, more victims, and more people displaced. With more than 35 conflicts going on, the situation will not stop or be reversed soon. Among refugees, 51% are young people who are less than 18 years old. The average time they stay in a camp is 17 years. Providing refugees and displaced people with life-saving aid is a moral duty and an international obligation. But there's more than that. Ask parents in refugee camps what they want for their children. They all seek the same thing first, education. In emergency situations, education at all levels matters. Education makes a real difference. Most parents' dream is that their children go to university. The same goes for young people. And yet higher education is too often neglected. Only 1% of refugees have access to higher education. The others are left behind, vulnerable, hopeless. What a waste. We have to turn this tide. How can we do more, better and faster? As hospitals have emergency services, education should also have emergency programs. So let's set up a rapid response mechanism for higher education in emergencies. No need to reinvent the wheel. Universities are used to hosting foreign students and scholars to exchange programs and mobility. So let's put them at the center of a rapid response mechanism. Integrating refugees and other forcibly displaced students is not that fundamentally different from integrating any other student. Now, to make it work in emergencies, we need to remove barriers that refugees and forced migrants face to accessing higher education, such as problems with visas, recognition of previous qualifications, financial support, and other individual guidance sensitive to their specific needs. To address these issues, we need to find more collaborative solutions and set up a coordination facility, a combination of online solutions and a help desk service to ensure an effective emergency academic response. And indeed, we need a financing facility. For that, we plan to do three things. One, create an endowment and bring together some donors. That's a classical step. Two, raise a youth education solidarity levy, the YES levy, within the global academic community to make the YES fund. If each student gives $1, we will make more than 230 million per year. Three, launch a venture capital fund that will tap into the most exciting innovator talents among refugees, forced migrants, and host communities to achieve solutions for the future. This is the Blue Crow Dynamic Fund looking for return on investment, but also for social impact. That's a new, bold step. And that's it. Our RRM is working now. We can do more, better and faster. What a difference. Let's make education become a true catalyst for recovery. Let's prepare a new generation of leaders who will be responsible for rebuilding war-torn countries. Engineers, doctors, scientists, teachers, civil servants. The great Einstein, he too was a refugee. Let's follow in his footsteps. Let's build hope for the future. Together, we can make it happen. Thank you very much for this inspiring uh, initiative. And we know that education is falling in the cracks between short-term humanitarian aid and, and longer-term development aid. And this is certainly one of the bridges to kind of link these two over the longer term. I'd like now to turn to His Excellency Anibal Cabaco Silva to talk about jobs and skills. Access to education, we know, is vital to building peaceful societies. But it's also vital to provide access to economic opportunities, uh, to provide skills. So I'd like to uh, ask you a very open question. How, in your view, can education contribute to reducing economic, to producing, uh, um, economic opportunities, to reducing economic inequalities? Thank you. As I was informed beforehand, I'll speak in Portuguese. No mundo de globalização, interdependência em que vivemos, a educação, principalmente a educação básica, é amplamente reconhecida como 
um bem social global. Tal como o combate às alterações climáticas, tal como a promoção da estabilidade financeira ou a segurança internacional. A educação é a base da construção de sociedades inclusivas. Os benefícios da educação ultrapassam as fronteiras e as gerações presentes e não se confinam a este ou àquele grupo social. Os portugueses, os americanos, os alemães e muitos outros povos beneficiam dos investimentos em mais e melhor educação feitos em África, feitos na Ásia, na América Latina ou em outras partes do globo. O um mundo de cidadãos detentores de educação, detentores de conhecimento, é um lugar melhor para viver e é mais fácil a convivência interreligiosa, interétnica ou interlinguística e entre as diferentes nacionalidades. A educação potencia a mobilidade social. A iliteracia é um mal social global. A ausência ou insuficiência de oferta de serviços de educação em várias partes do mundo é uma das razões das graves crises internacionais que têm vindo a ocorrer. Os efeitos negativos da insuficiência de investimento em educação não se confinam aos países onde isso se verifica. Esses efeitos atravessam fronteiras e adquirem uma dimensão global. Os baixos níveis de educação influenciam negativamente não apenas o desenvolvimento económico dos países e o bem-estar dos cidadãos. Os baixos níveis de educação são também uma fonte de ameaças globais, como é o caso dos fluxos de imigração ilegais, os fundamentalismos e extremismos radicais, a violência, o terrorismo internacional, o tráfico de droga, a degradação ambiental. As ameaças globais são argumentos particularmente relevantes para que os governos e as organizações internacionais cooperem para promover mais e melhor educação, para promover a difusão do conhecimento a nível global, o que deve ser feito em paralelo com a erradicação da pobreza extrema. É um contributo para impedir as crises antes delas ocorrerem. É por isso importante que os agentes políticos compreendam que a educação é um instrumento relevante para a construção de sociedades inclusivas e justas, abertas ao diálogo e respeitadoras das diferenças e da diversidade. O apoio à educação é um domínio em que o longo prazo deve ser tido em devida conta e os interesses das gerações futuras devem ser devidamente valorizados. Para além das vontades políticas, é importante mobilizar outros atores. A educação inclusiva é um domínio em que o contributo da sociedade civil e da comunidade empresarial é particularmente importante. Há que demonstrar-lhes que a educação é do seu próprio interesse e ajudá-las a organizar-se para, com eficácia, promover o aumento da produção e consumo de serviços de educação, sem esquecer a literacia digital e o desenvolvimento de competências para o exercício de uma profissão no século XXI. Em várias partes do mundo, é preciso eliminar barreiras ao acesso à educação. Por exemplo, as crianças podem não ir à escola porque não têm transporte ou porque têm que trabalhar para ajudar a família. Neste contexto, há que pensar no modelo escolar 
e nos mecanismos de inovação social que melhor se adaptem à ideia de educação inclusiva. Esse é um dos objetivos do projeto do Clube de Madrid Education for Shared Societies. Penso que os governos e as comunidades locais devem ocupar um lugar central na busca de soluções. Em Portugal, falamos há muitos anos de descentralizar competências em matéria de educação, o que em concreto significa dar às autarquias, aos municípios, mais responsabilidades, não apenas na gestão dos equipamentos, mas na escola como um todo. Julgo que nesse processo é absolutamente determinante que a escola seja assumida como o centro da vida de cada comunidade. Isso implica um envolvimento das autarquias, mas também das famílias, das instituições e das empresas locais. A escola não é apenas mais um edifício, não é apenas um depósito de crianças. É na escola que projetamos o futuro de cada comunidade e, como tal, o futuro do país. A educação é, de facto, a base da verdadeira inclusão social. A comunidade como um todo deve empenhar-se em combater o absentismo, a exclusão, o bullying e o insucesso. Isto é válido para Portugal, é válido para qualquer país. Em Portugal eu tenho a honra de estar ligado a um projeto que tem tentado, de alguma forma, dar corpo a esta ideia e procurado mobilizar a sociedade civil, concretamente empresários e também autarquias, para combater o insucesso e o absentismo escolar. É a Associação Empresários para a Inclusão Social. Esta iniciativa visa melhorar a qualificação e as condições de empregabilidade dos jovens, atacando um dos principais fatores de exclusão social e contribuindo para a criação de igualdade de oportunidades. O sucesso escolar das crianças é promovido através de mediadores que executam um trabalho de proximidade junto dos alunos, das famílias, da escola e da comunidade. Visa corrigir e prevenir fatores de risco e introduzir elementos de sucesso na organização das escolas. Esta forma de responsabilidade social das empresas é um bom exemplo de apoio ao rendimento escolar das crianças, uma forma concreta de combater a exclusão social passível de ser replicado em qualquer país. Eu estou firmemente convencido que as respostas para a promoção da educação inclusiva ainda que pensadas globalmente, têm de ser aplicadas localmente, sob pena de não surtir em efeito. É na multiplicação de pequenos bons exemplos que podemos criar uma melhor sociedade partilhada a nível global. Obrigado. Thank you, Excellency. It was very eloquent. To, if education is a global good, then there are indeed global bads, right? Which education can perform a role. We, very eloquent description of the, the vital role of education to tackle inequalities and to strengthen the social cohesion, which is at the heart of uh, shared societies. And we, we turn now to His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso uh, to talk uh, not just about education for skills um, and knowledge, but also values. Um, contributing to also to building, learning, belonging in this notion of shared societies. And I'd just like to ask the question to you, Your Excellency, what role can education play in your view in promoting shared values and engaged citizenship? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to answer your very precise question. Let me just first, as also a member, one of the Portuguese members of the Club Madrid, welcome 
all of you that came to our country here in Lisbon. I really want also to have a word of congratulations to Elena Aguero and her team. This uh, event was organized in a record time. I told her since the beginning that the Portuguese are good in improvisation. <laughs> and so I'm happy to see you all here because when we started with this idea of organizing this in Lisbon, um, it was so, so limited the time that some people would say, if you were working in some other countries, would say it's impossible. But in Portugal, we always try to make things possible. Um, the question that you have put to me um, about education and values, indeed, as it was already highlighted, education is a public good. But I'd like to start by the point being a human right. And of course, as former or current decision makers, political decision makers or policy makers, we are concentrated, we are trying to focus on education as a policy for the society, shared societies. But in my view, the best way to look at it is look at the peop a people's level, each individual, each person, as a right that a boy or a girl has to education. Because after all, education is the way we have for people to acquire knowledge, science, culture, access to art. And there is nothing in life more important than science or art. Of course, if we don't count on the more personal issues like uh, friendship or love or spiritual dimension, but this is for the intimate level, for the personal level. But when we think what we as decision makers can give our kids for them to have access to the goods, the benefits of art, science, knowledge, it's through education. It's that the way they have to to access those, those benefits. So it's basically a fundamental human right. Of course, in uh, policy making at global level, we have this as a goal, it's a sustainable development goal four of the agenda for sustainable development. And uh, that's, uh, I'd like to say also that we have a problem there because the global effort for education is in fact underfinanced. Uh, I'm a member, I've been work, working also on the Global Coalition for Education and uh, I'm a member of the Global Business uh, Coalition, uh, working with Gordon Brown and others. I see some of you also are members of that coalition. And in fact, when you compare education to the investment we make in other areas, probably because the results are not seen immediately. So to build a road, to build a bridge, to build a dam, it can take one, two, three, four years. To build a university student uh, with a, gra a grade can take 20 years or, or at least 15 years. So, in fact, the levels of investment are not sufficient when we think, namely, in the developing world. But besides the issue of the financing, we have the problem of the concept and the problem of the curricula. Of course, now based on my experience at the European Commission uh, that I was leading 10 years, as you know, uh, I can share some of this experience with you very briefly. Uh, the European Union, as you know, education is a national matter. It's a national competence. While we have, uh, it's true, some programs, it was already mentioned, the very famous program Erasmus, and uh, it's uh, so important. Not only the program Erasmus, everything that has to do with the European area for uh, education and research, there is a silent revolution going on in Europe on this matter. I would like you to know. I mean, for instance, if you go here to the universities in Lisbon, we see sometimes more foreigners than nationals. That was not the case when I was a student at the university. I was only a Portuguese or some people from the former Portuguese colonies from the new independent states. It was in fact in the transition of uh, the African countries, so official language, which, which is Portuguese. But we, have, we had no other people in the, in the universities. And uh, in my university of Lisbon here, there was zero zero professors that were not Portuguese. And this was not so many years ago. Today, it's completely different. And if you go all over, I teach also in other parts of Europe now, besides having here a position at Catholic University in Lisbon. It's amazing. There is a silent revolution going on, not only the exchange of students, but researchers. And that's very, very positive. I, I insist on that because sometimes everybody is negative. Uh, I, and I don't share 
what I've been calling the intellectual glamour of pessimism. <laughs> there are very good things happening in Europe in terms of education. But it is true that we have to do more because one of the challenges we have is precisely this of reacting to those negative sentiments of xenophobia, nationalism, uh, sometimes racism. And so, and the challenge of building multicultural society that we have today in Europe. It's becoming more and more urgent because of the refugee issue, illegal migrants, and so on. So we're here also I'm positive. I think there is resistance because there is movement. It's because today's societies in Europe are more multicultural that we are seeing some parties, some sectors of society opposing and trying to create the obstacles in terms of what I call negative identities. One thing is to be patriot, and I don't think it will be realistic, and I think it will not be uh, good to have a kind of programs that will try to avoid patriotism. Because it's true that most of, our, of us, our first relation uh, in public terms with, with our country. But one thing is patriotism, another thing is nationalism in the bad sense of the word. So I think we need to have uh, open identities, being it in terms of nation, of... Um, ethnicity or religion, and these are issues that I think it's very important that we can educate people in terms of the openness. So the curricula is important. In Europe there are for many years the idea of having a European history of Europe made transnational. It has never been successful. So there is not a handbook for European history accepted in all our uh, universities or our uh, uh, secondary schools. Because, of course, the teaching of history is, remains basically national. But I think it is possible to do that teaching of history also in a spirit of openness uh, to others. And there are some efforts now to do it. So what is the content? What are we teaching our, our kids, our children, both at family level or uh, in the school? So this is certainly one of the most important issues that we have to, to deal with today is to teach our kids for multicultural and shared societies. And here again, I believe the most important thing is to do it at the level of the person. So, by the way, the European Treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon, Article 2nd, he mentions as values the human dignity and also the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Not the rights of minorities, rights of people Persons belonging to minorities is a different thing. So we have to think about the person in concrete, the man, the woman, the child. And this is the very important thing. Because it is only if you have self-confident young boys or young girls that we can have shared societies. If we have uh, boys and girls that are self-confident, if we promote their self-esteem, they can build societies that are much more tolerant. And that, for instance, is why I think it's very important in the curricula to have an important part for art and for sport. Because sometimes people coming from disadvantaged communities, they do better in art or in sport than in other classic fields of knowledge. So for people to feel they belong and they can be respected by the other colleagues when they are in, in the school. I believe this is very important. Finally, and that is my only concern I want to tell you, it's a question that I've been putting myself very often. How is it possible that today that we have in general a higher level of education, the level of politics is going down? <laughs> so, uh, it, it should be having a higher level of, of a higher level of education. We should expect a higher level of um, political discourse and uh, public discourse in our societies, not only uh, political. And in fact, passing a lo lower level, a more vulgar level, which is interesting. Uh, in Portuguese, when we say someone is well-educated, bem educado, we don't mean necessarily at a very good form of education. We mean, sometimes you can be bem educado, I mean well-educated, and have no formal education. You are polite. And that's interesting. In Portuguese, that's very interesting. We say bem educado for polite people. And uh, I think today we are losing that politeness in the public uh, discourse in general. And this is a very interesting perverse effect of the fact that we are democratizing education, great, but the massification brings more vulgar, 
more tweet-like messages that are sometimes aggressive. And so I believe that's also the role for leaders today, that we have to promote tolerance in our societies, starting among ourselves in the political life, treating others with respect, and understanding that at the end what matters is not the nation, is not the state, is certainly not the party, not even mankind. Mankind is such a general concept. Reminds me of Dostoevsky saying that uh, there was that person that loved mankind in general, but hated every individual in particular. <laughs> no, we need to show love and respect for each person, a boy, a girl, a man, or a woman. And this is the role of leadership and the role of education, putting the accent on the person and from the person's building self-confident and shared societies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Excellency, for reminding us of that you, education is a basic human right, and it's also essential for dignity. And we should always keep in mind that, that uh, the starting point is at the level of the individual learner, the individual young uh, woman and man. So thank you very much. I turn now to Excellency Rebecca Grinspan um, to look at the Ibero-American region. I, we know that education is a standalone goal in the 2030 agenda, but it's also essential to progress across the goals. Uh, what, in your view, uh, Madam, is, is how is education being leveraged in, as a motor for development, for dignity, in the, in, in the Ibero-American region? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, uh, congratulate the Club of Madrid for, for this event, the uh, president of the Club of Madrid. Thank you for the foundation, uh, the Gulbenkian Foundation. I feel part of the ex-presidents of Portugal Club now. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, let me just uh, share with you several of the things that are happening in the Ibero-American space. These are the 22 countries that speak Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Europe. So 22 countries that we are going to meet in the Heads of State Summit uh, next 15 and 16 of November in Guatemala, and precisely we just had the meeting of the ministers of education of the 22 countries, uh, where we uh, did speak very uh, thoroughly about the, the uh, sustainable development goals, because this is the agenda for the next summit, the, uh, for a more prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable uh, Ibero-American space yeah, for all the countries. So we, the, the subject of the meeting of the heads of state is precisely the 2030 agenda. Uh, and why we did choose this as, as the main topic for the summit is because really this is the only narrative that we have today that makes a call for a shared society, <laughs> makes a call for, a glo for, for global cooperation and not for fragmentation or co confrontation that are other narratives that we are hearing today in the world. So we are going to the summit not to discuss what, the what, but we are going to discuss the how, because the what has already been agreed in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, uh, let me just share a very few indicators about what has happened in Latin America uh, during these years, so you will understand what are the priorities and the challenges uh, we are facing. First, let's remember that in the, in, the, in the first 15 years of this century, the social structure of Latin America has changed because middle classes have expanded dramatically in the region. Education has, access to education, has expanded dramatically also in uh, primary and secondary school, and also in tertiary education. You heard the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of Portugal uh, saying that two out of every three students in Latin America today are first generation in their family that got to the university. Two in every three students in Latin America. So we can look through this indicator how much social mobility has happened during these uh, first years 
of the 21st century, dramatically so. And for the first time today, despite the last years that have been, you know, we have seen disacceleration in some countries entering into negative rates of growth, the truth is that for the first time in history, we have more people in the middle classes than below the poverty line. So this is a complete change in terms of expectations, in terms of social dynamics in the region. Now, what are, what are then the priorities for the future? What are the challenges? Well, first is that people are not asking for access, but for quality in the services. And we are convinced that today in our region, the inter, the, the intergener, the, uh, uh, intergenerational transmission of inequality will depend on the quality of education. If poor people continues to go to bad schools or and rich people continue to go to good schools, so we will not be it will it won't be possible to close the gaps in terms of inequalities in the region. And the inequalities in terms of quality of education are dramatic in our region, partly because societies are more fragmented. You know, in a way, we don't meet anywhere. We don't meet in schools because we go to different schools. We don't meet in the neighborhoods because the neighborhoods are different for each socioeconomic group. We don't meet in the commercial centers. Where do we meet? Where do we meet to really to have a common project of society for the future? And universities have to play a very important role in trying to get society together. So uh, this is a, 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 fundamental, a fundamental issue. So it's true that, uh, uh, and, and I think that you, you refer to that, uh, President Barroso, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we need to uh, emphasize the values and, and the uh, dignity of people and the self-confidence of students. But the problem is that the diversity, we are losing the diversity in terms of our public education because the middle class is going out because the quality of education in the public schools is going down. So if we don't reverse that trend, it will be impossible to meet in the schools and for the schools to be really the source of social cohesion that we need for a building a, a, a shared societies. The second thing that I want to, to share with you is with respect to our youth. Uh, Latin America has today probably the highest cohort of young people between 15 and 29 years old, between 15 and 29 nine years old. So this is a great opportunity. It's an asset for the future. These are the young people that can bring, you know, the countries forward in terms of the future of technology and innovation. But at the same time, one in every four of them do not go to school and is not inserted in the workplace. What we call the ninis. They are not here and not there. Three quarters of those are women. Three quarters of those are women that have you know, abandoned their studies for the care activities at home. So the response for women has to be thought, thought for differently because they are the ones that are not inserted, not in the labor market and not in education. And the rest for the young, uh, uh, guys, for the young boys, the problem is violence. The problem is gangs and violence and the organized crime where they have this, you know, a, a labor force that they can just uh, uh, bring to, to the, to the bats, as you, you said uh, before. And my, my, my last point is uh, what is a, a what is the challenges ahead? First, I think that very early childhood education. Access is still very low in our countries for early childhood education. And we all know from the studies that the inequalities start there. 
if we are not able to universalize also early childhood education, we are not going to be able to really take advantage of uh, the young people in, 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 in future skills. The second is we need more technical tertiary education. We go from high school to university, and the technical skills, the technical tertiary education is also very bad and a, a, a not widespread in the countries of, a, of the region. And we need more technical tertiary education, not only university education, but also technical education. And the third point with respect to higher education, with respect to the universities, let me just say that uh, 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 we doubled the university population in the last 15 years, doubled the university population in the last 15 years. But there is a mismatch with the labor market. And so what we are generating is a lot of frustration in the, long, in the young people. So there is this, this crossroad in terms of you know, very good indicators, more university students, uh, very young people, high expectations, middle classes, but the opportunities in the labor market are not matching the expectations of the young people. And this mismatch is very problematic, very problematic for the sustainable of democracy, very problematic in terms of growth, very problematic in terms of violence. And it disenfranchising of the young people uh, from the institutions and our democratic institutions. Uh, uh, and and uh, it, so it's not strange that when we look at the indicators in, in terms of democracy and, and values in the region, we see that we are at the lowest point of trust of the citizenship with respect to our republican institutions. The worst evaluated are the parliament, the government, the judiciary. So the problem of maintaining a strong democratic society is also part of this mismatch, this crossroad that we are confronting between what we, the expectations of our middle classes, of our young people, and the possibilities of and opportunities that we are having in the labor market. Capacities are not enough. Opportunities are necessary. Capacities have to meet with opportunities. And I think that that will be probably the biggest challenge we need to confront in the years ahead. Let me just say, President Sampaio, that I told you, you can count with us in that wonderful program uh, that you have launched uh, for higher education for the Syrian, uh, for the Syrian boys, uh, I hope Ibero-America and, uh, and girls. Oh, sorry, 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 my God, <laughs> and girls, uh, and I hope that the Ibero-America and, 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 and in this summit we will be able to really uh, uh, partner with you in, in such a wonderful initiative. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Secretary General, thank you very much. I think you, you said we have, the, we have the what, but we don't know the how. So this is a very interesting picture you've painted of uh, amazing change in the region, but also uh, lots of challenges, but also opportunities. And I think getting that balance right, I think, is essential. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've been discussing uh, what is the ultimate uh, soft power, which is the power of education. And uh, the power of education is a, a transformational force for individuals, for societies, for economies. Um, it's, it's a transformational force in itself, but it's also an integrative force in the sense that it, uh, uh, progress in education brings progress acro across all other goals on the sustainable development agenda to make them sustainable, and that's why it's so essential. Um, Nelson Mandela said education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, so we know that. But this means if, we, if education is a transformational force, we must also transform education. We can't just have any education. We need education that is inclusive, quality, that is relevant. We need education that is in tune with needs of societies and economies today and tomorrow. We need education for the 21st century. And on that note, I'd just like to thank our, our, 
our panelists, our distinguished panelists, for, for raising all the difficult questions and, and uh, setting a framework for our discussion today. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course, yes, please, yes. Been said, uh, has been said by all the speakers in this panel. Um, I think there is one essential concept which horizontally touches everything that has been said. You won't have shared societies and shared opportunities if you don't give everyone a sense of belonging to that community. You can't separate, really. If you want a community with unified unity, goals, ethnicity, as Mr. Burroughs was saying, and Professor Kavaksi too, you have to give everyone the possibility of having a sense of belonging. This applies to all religions, really, to all religions. If religions are separate, if they follow specific uh, fields and don't speak to the other, you, don't, you cannot integrate. I don't like the word. I don't like the word pluralism. I, work to, I like the word of diversity of our identities and giving everyone the sense of the opportunity to belong to that community. This is essential nowadays, and it will obviously be essential for the future. Yes, thank well, you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Last word. I, I completely agree. I, I will just uh, want to add that the sense of belonging is the building of inclusive identities. That you are several things at the same time. And you relate to people in different dimensions. So let's uh, agree that we are all complex people. We are several things at the same time. We don't have to renounce to be one thing to be the other. And probably there is the basis for a diversity and to be able to, to lead and, 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 and face this challenge. A logistic announcement. Coffee will be served outside. Just strike and slightly to the left. We will resume at 11.15. Thank you.